I'm Ed Higgins, and I was born in, in September 21st, 1925, in Fall River, Massachusetts. And <clears throat> we grew up poor. And I uh, was drafted into the, into the service in spite of the fact that I was blind in one eye, and <clears throat> because I cheated but I did not want to be a 4F. And so I was drafted in, in February of 1944 into the military. And <clears throat> but first went, spent a little while at Camp Devons, and they finally decided to send me down to Aberdeen Proving Ground in, in Maryland where I joined the ordinance. My basic training was as an ammunition handler, which was not too useful. And <clears throat> I was then transferred into a, a weird little outfit that was doing experimental work on muzzle velocity. and. Uh, we trained at first at, at Camp Pickett, Virginia, and then down in, in, in uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where we tested the surviving attempt at doing this job. And even though it only worked in the middle of the day, we were sent overseas with it. I sailed from Brooklyn in on September 21st, 1920, 1944, and spent 13 days at sea on the way to, to Greenwich, Scotland. Then I spent uh, roughly a month in, in uh, various places in, in, in England getting our equipment in from the shipment and getting it fixed up and ready to go, and sailed on an LST into from Portsmouth into Rouen, France, and then on into Paris, where we got our condition up, equipment ready to really go, and then. <coughs> Got to test the equipment in. This was at, at the Christmas season. We traveled north up into into uh, Lorraine uh, in December. On starting on December twenty fifth, up into Lorraine and into. We went in with, with Patton's relief column going into, into Bastogne in uh, early January of, of, of uh, 1945. We operated in the Bastogne area with all of the artillery battalions that were in that area over the next several weeks and then went on with the rest of the, the troops through the Ardennes in the, in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we ended up <coughs> calibrating the guns of, of every major artillery piece in the Third Army once we got the equipment working. And that took a modification of the electronics in order to make it work. Uh, we ended up at the end of the war down where Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Germany come together. And we went from there to a place called Hillesleben up in in, in Germany, where the, which was 
the Germans' equivalent of of uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground, where we were calibrating guns that were going to the Pacific. Uh, That's a uh, very good add to this point, and uh, tell me a little bit more about, uh, in essence, you were working toward what was going to be taking place in the Pacific because the war had not been ended at that time. Uh, and then what were your main duties from that point until you finally came back uh, to the U.S. of America? <laughs> not much. Not, not much. <laughs> we ended up outside Nuremberg and it was mostly make worth. We didn't have anything really to do. and. They came up with a, a bore gauge, which was a, a cheap way of measuring the wear on a, on a gun. And uh, though we did that around, but mostly we did nothing. Played a lot of poker. <laughs> and uh, then at, toward the end of that period, we, I ended up in uh, one of Hitler's stadiums, the one that you see all the time in the newsreels with the, the, the swastika getting blown up. Well, they'd been, the outfits that were leaving for the Pacific had turned in all their equipment and, and it was all piled up in this, this stadium. They decided it was unsightly and needed to get it out of there. So they were going to move all of this equipment from from there to a place about 75 miles away at Kitsigan. And uh, I ended up being the dispatcher. So uh, we would take a, a two and a half ton truck, put a Jeep in the bed, tie another two and a half ton truck on behind it with a trailer behind the, the two and a half ton trucks. and they okay, take it to Kits again, and they had to go right through the middle of Nuremberg to get the Kits again. Well, needless to say, they had trouble getting this, this kind of stuff through that big long, especially since most of these guys didn't have driver's licenses. And I remember. <coughs> Patents MPs were just raising hell with this operation. And uh, this lieutenant that I'd been driving around, well, he was in charge of the, getting the stuff out of there. He, uh, he was squawking about how all these guys were getting picked off and by Patton's MPs going through in Nuremberg. And <clears throat> Yeah, and most of them didn't have licenses, and that wasn't didn't help. He said, "Oh, by the way, do you have a license?" I said, "No." <laughs> so he wrote me out one. I I used that to get my Massachusetts license. I used the Massachusetts license to get my New Jersey license. I used the New Jersey license to get my Florida license. <laughs> the only time I ever ran a passed the test was when I was in Aruba. I was the technical manager of the refinery there and and uh, I passed that test and my wife flunked and she used to always be bitching about my driving. <laughs> oh any rate. Hey, could you could you share with the folks out there uh, the images you had of uh, General Patton? You said you saw him a few well, times. Well, I just saw him, but he just just drove, driving by. That's a, that's a, that's not not really an introduction. <laughs> yeah, I did see him though, a couple of times, and and uh, but he was he was always around. It, it, wherever the action was, he was there. And so, where did you you actually came back uh, home? Uh, how long were you in the process? You were 13 days going over when you came back. Uh... Coming back was a was a, a luxury liner that had been captured from the Germans in World War One, 
and it had been converted into U.S. Army Troop Ship America, and it had gyro stabilizers, and, and, and it's a pretty, except that we didn't have, as we got loaded on that ship, we were supposed to be in apartment E7, down in the, way down the bottom, and as, after we just loaded onto the, onto the ship, something came over the, the squawk box saying, those in apartment E7, please stay on deck. And of course, we were figuring they were going to unload us, because at that point it took 200 points to get home from, from Europe. I had 45. So, you know, I was very nervous about staying on the ship. And uh, so they said, they, those on E7 in apartment, we, we've run out of room for, for uh, second lieutenants, so we're going to have to take your compartment. That was the last me message we got, and all of a sudden they're casting off the lines and the ship left. Woo! We could <laughs> We made ourselves a home on one of the hatch covers. <laughs> That's where we spent the whole trip. <laughs> and at least you got very back happy to water. be there. <laughs> so we happy to be there. So you came across in what? Uh, uh, how many days was that? Well, that was fast. And where that, did you land? Uh, we landed in Boston. Okay. And they immediately loaded us off and sent us to Camp Miles Standish somewhere in Massachusetts, yeah. And the next morning we got on a train and went down to Aberdeen. Well, they didn't know what the hell to do with us. Cause, and they put us up in the WAC barracks there. The WAC had disbanded, I guess, by that time. That was the Women's Army Corps. So we, we, they had these empty barracks they had nothing to do with, so they put us in. And they had nothing for us to do. So finally, I guess we were only there a few days and they decided they'd put us on temporary duty to our homes. So I had 45 days of temporary duty, which was my first furlough. <laughs> and uh, after that we went back and they still had no idea what we going what they wanted to do with us. Well, so most of us went AWOL. I was I spent a couple of weeks at a soldiers and sailors home in in Washington and and a couple of guys that were too chicken to go away wall uh, they 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 were there as contacts and <clears throat> well finally they we decided it was time to come back and and uh, they started discharging a bunch of the guys with the, the most points and the rest of us they decided they put the work and I went to work in the uh, the photo lab and and in the proving ground, developing film. I'd never done it before in my life, but there I was doing it. And <clears throat> I got a picture of me at that point, if you're interested. Yeah. Where the hell did I knew? put my... Right behind you, uh, in your chair. Uh, oh, in my seat, okay, good. And this is just before I was discharged. Oh yeah, let me put that up for the camera right there. Yeah, look at you that. guys side by side there. All right. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't fare very well. <laughs> I wasn't a bad looking kid in those days. Hey. So it looks like you got two stripes on there, Master Sergeant. Yeah, no, no, that's that's technician fifth grade. That's as far as I ever got. Yeah. Okay. That, that was a, a good one to a corporal. Well, you see, Rusty, I was first class in the army. It was per private, first class, though. Private. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that's a good photo. All right, you got out of the uh, military. I got out in, in, in June, uh, no, excuse me, in April of 2006. 2000, uh, 1946. Right. And uh, there was absolutely no work in Fall River at that point. And I started taking the 5220 
they give you 20 bucks, 20 bucks a week for 52 weeks. And I did that for a few months, and then I took a job on the road selling magazines. And I, I worked that from, I started down in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and worked my way all the way up to the Canadian border in five months or so, six months or so. And then I decided I had enough of that. <clears throat> so you got into the, uh, co college, your college and university? I was waiting training. to get into college at that yeah, point. Right. And uh, I, I actually couldn't get started until uh, August of, uh, of, of 47. So um, I had a, f a few other jobs, like I worked on a, a lunch counter in, in Hyannis for the summer in, in, in Hyannis, Massachusetts on the Cape. And I kind of liked the Cape after that. <laughs> So oh, that's why the last 25 years we owned a place in Florida and a place in, on Cape Cod and we were snowbirds for 25 years. And your university training was where? Was, was at, at Northeastern University. Mm -hmm. I, I began a dynasty. My, uh, I graduated in 52, my son graduated in in 1980, as a, a mechanical engineer, I graduated as a, as a as a chemical engineer, and he just retired from General Electric after 20, 29 years in the aircraft engine. He retired as the the principal consulting engineer for aircraft engines. His son graduated from Northeastern as a computer engineer in 2013. And he just started this new company, a new, a new company of his own, which just got fine funded by a, a venture capital outfit. So he's building up customers and, and employees at this point. And your work took you to a variety of places. I visited 107 countries. I probably worked in 85 of those, something like that one point or another. I lived in Germany for the year 1959. I lived in Germany for the, in 30, in, in uh, 63, 64, and I lived in Aruba for three and a half years. Uh, then I stayed put, um, my family stayed put and I, I did the traveling. Well, that gives a pretty good summary of, mm -hmm. so you've been uh, fortunate in many respects, as we all have. You grew up in poverty, pretty yeah. much, yeah. as did so many people then, and I can definitely relate to yeah. you when you wondered where the next meal would come from, and that kind of thing.